If I might all ask that we stand for the prayer, please. Now can I ask everybody to bow their head? Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here today in the presence of our diverse community of young and ambitious students who are actively seeking to better themselves and their community for education. As well as the esteemed educators here before us today that have made it their life goal and honor to serve you by guiding these students on their path. I humbly ask of you, Lord, to let your multitude of blessings and good works continue here at the University of Pikeville forever in your honor and name. Amen. Good morning and welcome uh, to our fall convocation. Once again, we get to assemble together to uh, make that commitment to continue to contribute to the mission and the heritage of this university. And it's invigorating. I, I, I must say that I'm inspired to be able to be a small part of being able to do what this institution has done for 127 years. Uh, and you're very much a part of that. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Philip Westgate, who uh, does a great job of providing us with the musical accomplishments. <laughs> and Mr. Johnson Schott that shared that great uh, hymn with us. I'd also like to thank our student leaders for participating, from Billy Cochran, Billy, who led our prayer. <laughs> Daniel Sullivan, Daniel and uh, Alex Donovan. <laughs> Got a fan club over there, it looks like. Also joining us on the platform is Dr. James Browning, professor of religion, and Robert Music, chap campus chaplain, and Lori Worth, our provost. And, uh, and I want to acknowledge Kay, Webb, okay, stand up so can we make sure we all know who you are. Thanks for being here. I don't know if there's any members of the Board of Trustees here. I can't see far enough to identify you out there, but with this College of Optometry, that's gonna all get better, so uh, we, we, have, we have hope. But at any rate, it is significant the leadership that the, le the leadership of the Board of Trustees is and has and will continue to provide to this institution. Their role is vital and their service is much appreciated and our success in future depends on their work and their dedication. So we appreciate them being here. And you know, as much as we all need to work together uh, to perform our task and our mission, uh, we have to have a leader, and we're fortunate to have a, a leader that will take us to a new level. Now, when you look at the progress of this institution over the last 127 years, uh, you can see, and if you've been around as long as I have, you've experienced the, the ups and the downs and the goods and the bads. But, you know, over time, even with the bumps, the course has been upward, and it's going to continue to be that way. We've reached a new level of, uh, of service and responsibility for a larger area of our region. And uh, we, we uh, are ready to take on new roles, and for that we need a leader that uh, has the vision and the energy and the foresight and the commitment to help us get there. So with that, I present to you our president, Dr. Burton Webb. Dr. Webb. It's really great to be able to speak to you today. And uh, I'm not, uh, not at all overwhelmed by the fact that this is 127 years that this has been going on. Uh, this is a significant place and a significant day, and I am uh, very privileged to be here. This convocation in this particular format is, of course, new to me, uh, but I thought it might make a really good opportunity to speak to all of you as a group 
Uh, this is not the day that some of you might be anticipating. Some people might be expecting me to cast the vision that this is the day that I would say, these are the paths, walk ye in them. That's not what today is. That day will come, and that day will come in, in the not too distant future, probably sometime in October. Uh, but today, I wanted you to, to hear my heart, because I really believe that it's from the heart that vision grows. So understanding a little of the passion that I have for place and for tradition and for, frankly, faith, I think is an important component of what we're here to do today. So to begin with, I'd like to say a few words of thanks. First of all, I thank Governor Patton. Thank you for the introduction, but more importantly, thank you for your years of leadership on this campus. You have been a tremendous asset for a long, long time. I would be remiss if I didn't thank Lucy, Charity, and Sherry, and I know you're all in the room. The three of you have probably put more effort into getting this whole day together than anyone else, so thank you to those three women. <laughs> About a week or so ago, I sent a copy of the litany out to the faculty, and I got wonderful feedback on that, and I am thankful for it because without that feedback, I think there could have been some significant issues that arose. And, and I thank you for that. I think it's important. And I'm looking right at one of the people who sat in my office and talked to me for an hour. And I think that's fantastic. And the other one, I don't know where you are. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Over there. So thank you for that. I appreciate that to Nancy and Tom. You guys were great. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, uh, to the woman sitting alone in that row, uh, she must have presidential spouse cooties. Uh, because she's sitting by herself to Kay. Um, she puts up with all the late nights and the early mornings, and thank you for that, dear. Uh, you are a tremendous asset in my life. There was a man who had two sons. One day, the younger son did something absolutely outrageous. He asked his father for his portion of the family wealth long before his parents were dead. And then he disappeared. The older son was, like most firstborn children, a rule follower who tried to do everything to perfection. He was obsessed with getting things right and was really good at it. Over time, his father had given him more and more responsibility in the family business, and frankly, he loved it. The older son was intelligent and hardworking. Early successes had given him a strong sense of self-confidence and even a little bit of pride at his loyalty to the family and the family business. He cared about his employees, and he worked diligently to make their lives better. Under his leadership, the company grew, and it became increasingly successful. At first, his brother's absence didn't really bother him all that much, but as the days passed into weeks, the older brother began to wonder what the other, younger brother was doing with his time away. He watched his father slip in and out of mild depression as the days grew longer and then became weeks and months. Sometimes the old man would sit for hours on the porch just looking across the horizon. And though dad was still engaged and responsive, the older son could tell that his father missed the younger son. But he, the older son, was busy with the family business. He was proud of the work that he did for the family, so mostly he just tried to put his brother out of his mind. Eventually, a seed of bitterness grew to life in the mind of the older son. My brother must be up to no good. I bet he's out partying his brains out. Who knows what else? The older son thought as he watched his dad suffer, if, if I could ever get a hold of my brother, I would give him a piece of my mind. I'll tell him all the ways he's disappointing dad. I'll make him feel so guilty. What a jerk. A year passed. No news. No letters, no postcards, not even a text message. The older son went through the motions of each day but became increasingly obsessed with rules, regulations, and policies. He worked hard to make it impossible for any of his employees to act like his younger brother. Though he tried to resist it, there were moments that he had to admit he hated his younger brother. No, wait a minute, that's not true. He hated what his younger brother did. He still loved his younger brother. Still, it became increasingly difficult for him to tell the difference, and sometimes he would lie awake at night and wonder, what kind of mischief is that younger brother up to? The employees started to notice the difference, too. They loved the older brother, and they really loved the father, but 
the work was somehow less joyful. They listened loyally as the older brother lectured them on faithfulness to the company and the rules that they needed to follow. They already did all of those things, but the older brother was so emphatic, it became discouraging. Sometimes they wondered why the father, who still owned the business after all, let the older brother get away with some of the things that he did. Then one afternoon, while the older brother was away on a business trip, the younger brother returned. He had lost everything. He'd wasted much of his life and would carry the scars of his poor decisions forever. But the father was beside himself with pleasure to see his long-lost son. He jumped off the porch and ran to meet him on the road. Then he did something really outlandish. He threw him a huge party. It was bigger than a wedding reception. He invited all of the extended family and all of the employees. And they had a large, large feast. That same night, the older brother returned from his trip, and as he approached the house, he could see all of the lights blazing and could hear the steady beat of music from across the lawn. At first, he was excited. A party. What fun. Dad's out of his depression. He hardly ever threw parties, but as he drew closer, he looked through the window and he saw his younger brother dancing in the middle of the living room. He stopped. How could Dad throw a party for that idiot? He's been gone so long, I'm sure he's been up to no good. Just look at it. Look at how long his hair is, and look at how thin he is. That's a sure sign of someone who's doing drugs. I bet he's picked up all kinds of diseases, too. He's such a scumbag. I can't go in there. The older brother thought, if I go in there, I'll be validating everything my younger brother has done. And that's not okay. I am not going in. So he stood there on the hillside, overlooking the party, getting more and more angry. That's when the father showed up, tapped him on the shoulder and said, come inside, please. Your brother is home and, oh, stop it. Just shut up. I can't believe that you would throw him a party. You've never even offered to let me have a few friends over for dinner, he yelled. I can't believe you. You're allowing that sleazy, drug-addicted idiot into the house. Get him out of my house. Now, I'm just guessing most of you have heard that story before, but probably not quite like that. For those of you who have heard it before, clearly I've taken some license with it. Great stories have incredible power. They have layers of meaning that go far beyond the obvious. And I'd like to ignore the obvious meanings for just a few minutes to examine some of the things in the story that are more pertinent to our context. To understand this story properly, I think it's necessary to change the point of view to separate yourself from a narrative that is so familiar to so many of us and consider it from the point of view of the other. If you think back a little more than 2,000 years to the historicity of this story and the context in which it was told, Jesus is the character who told this story, and it closely paralleled his immediate audience. Scholars believe that when Jesus told this, he was surrounded by the lowest members of his society, tax collectors, prostitutes, and others, who were considered to be undesirable. He was surrounded, in a sense, by prodigals. Telling them the Father would welcome them home no matter what they did was important, essential even. But on the periphery of his audience were members of the intellectual and financial elite. The teachers of the law stood outside the immediate circle and muttered about Jesus' endorsement by association. He was associating with the undesirable. But Jesus was a master storyteller. He knew the power of narrative to make change, and so he kept on with his plot and held the second son back until second. He twisted the story and made, a, made an example with the back row. But here I stand today in the group of a mix of fac- faculty members and staff members and students. You are the intellectual leaders. You are the social leaders. You are the influencers of our campus. Many of you are the rule writers, the faithful instructors, the keepers of tradition. This may not be true of everyone, but I think that in general, I stand in the midst of older brothers, not prodigals. As a fellow academic and scholar, as a leader and someone who's been involved in policymaking for many years, I've got to tell you, I represent the older brother too. I am much more like him 
than I am like the prodigal. I think many, though perhaps not all of us, can relate to that. Whether we like it or not, that's the place we hold in the story, so I flipped it. The older brother was intelligent, loyal, confident. He was a rule follower. Because I think many of us can relate to him more than the younger brother, I'd like to pursue him for just a moment. And with that in mind, I think there are three things we should consider about the older brother and about his interactions. And they might inform us as leaders, and probably more importantly, inform me as someone who needs to speak occasionally from the heart. First, I think that it's a real temptation for those of us who are bright and intelligent and quick-witted to sometimes look down on people around us. We must be careful not to look down on those who struggle with what comes easily to us. It's great to have ready access to knowledge, but true wisdom is found in knowing when to apply your knowledge by understanding the need and then acting at the right moment. Our pursuit of the truth and the transformative power that it brings are lifelong endeavors. Not everyone who attends the University of Pikeville comes from the same background. The playing field is not always level. It's certainly not level at the beginning. We need to help those who struggle get to the point where they can climb on their own. And then we need to let them climb. And sometimes that means letting them fall but catching them and helping them to climb again. This is part of our calling. The second thing I'd like to say is to pursue service, but do it from an orientation of love. Love can be defined in an awful lot of ways. C.S. Lewis did a great job with four loves. He described them, each of them in Greek, but I'd like to take it a little different approach. I have a good friend whose name is Tom Ord. He's a theologian and he's a writer about love. It's, it's his life's work. And he defines love this way. To love is to act intentionally in sympathetic and empathetic response to those, to others, to promote overall well-being. I stumbled on that, so let me read it again. To love is to act intentionally in sympathetic, empathetic response to others to promote overall well-being. With that definition, service to others is the natural consequence. We serve not for what we get in return, but to intentionally promote the overall well-being. In my view, this is at the heart of what it means to be the U-Pike family. This is what it means to be a leader in our context. If I could take another familiar passage again and change it, I would do it this way. This is a passage from Paul that's often read at weddings. Think of it, though, not in the context of love, but in the context of leadership. I'm going to flip the words. Leaders are patient. Leaders are kind and not jealous. Leaders do not brag and are not arrogant. They do not act unbecomingly. Leaders don't seek their own. They're not provoked. They, provoked. they do not take into account wrong suffered. Do not rejoice in evil, but rejoice in truth. Leadership bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. If leaders act from a position of love, the last phrase would be stronger in every measure. This is servant leadership. This is the heart that I spoke of. Finally, I would encourage each of us, don't just stand on the hillside. Take intentional action that will improve the overall well-being of the university. I feel like I have to caution us, though, because that is not always an easy road. Sometimes it requires sacrifice. Sometimes we need to find ways to hold people we love accountable, to do the things that they have promised to do. Overall well-being and personal comfort aren't always compatible. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're not. In his book, Desiring the Kingdom, James Smith postulates that we all construct something called a social imaginary that is built from the things that we do each and every day. In, in the story of the two brothers, the things that the older brother believed about his younger brother were actually never confirmed as fact. It was his obsession with them, his daily rehearsal of them, that made every detail real in his mind. 
Smith contends that we have the power to change the social imaginary by altering the things that we choose to do every day. Said another way, we can be intentional, intentional about increasing the overall well-being of our students, colleagues, and the institution by choosing to act in very specific ways. I think that Jesus ended this story in the way that he did for a reason. If you know the original story, you know that he never gave a resolution. He left one brother in the house dancing, the other brother standing on the hill, and the father standing in between them. Dr. Shirley Maguire was my favorite English professor in college. She was half nuts and purely wonderful. Uh, I, I learned more from her than from anyone else outside of the sciences. Uh, she was a fantastic writer and she taught me a lot. But she once told me that when authors leave a portion of the narrative dangling, they're inviting the reader to, invite, to invent their own conclusions. Whether you identify more with the older brother or the younger brother, please listen as I turn the story once again. The younger brother's been gone for three weeks. The father is mildly depressed and sitting on the porch, but instead of complaining and writing new policies, the older brother notices the sadness of his father and thinks, Dad really misses my brother. What can I do to end his pain? So the older brother talks to his dad. I'd like to take a few days off. Can you run the business for a while? He doesn't tell his father what he's up to. He just asks for time away. The next morning, the older brother heads out looking for his younger brother. And before long, it becomes abundantly apparent where his brother has been. For days, he follows in his brother's wake and learns of the people that he's hurt, those he has loved and left behind. The older brother pays the younger brother's debts and makes peace wherever he can. After a week of searching, the older brother finds the younger brother in a casino. He tells him about dad, about the business, about home. He pleads with his younger brother to please come back. Dad misses you. He sits on the porch all day just looking for you. It takes days. There's withdrawal to deal with, failure, pain, and loss. But finally, the older brother's vivid description of home and the father are so compelling that he convinces his younger brother to return. Do you see it? Empathy, service from an orientation of love and action. As they crest the hill arm in arm, the father sees them from his place on the porch. And, well, I think you can end that story. That's the picture of what family ought to be. That's the picture of what we ought to aspire to. I think I see pockets of it all around campus. It buds in places in dormitories, and I see it in the classroom. I see it in the middle of the quad. I see it in a lot of different places. But what if we could aspire to it as an institution? What if we could reach it? What kind of impact would that have on our local communities? Ponder that. Think about that. I'd like to suggest to you that we begin today by doing something with intentionality. I think all of you know that the University of Pikeville was started by a Presbyterian minister in 1889, 127 years ago. For most of our history, we were a college that was owned and operated by a particular denomination, the Presbyterian Church. That's no longer true. But our board of trustees and our mission statement and in other places affirm that we operate from Christian principles. They also are firm in their belief that we need to be, we must be, hospitable to people of all faiths and people who claim no faith. I wholeheartedly agree with both statements. And I understand that those statements put us in a place of tension. That we will have this constant pull between the tradition and history of faith and the fact that we no longer are that kind of a place. So I think it's something we need to understand and acknowledge and live into. Some Christian traditions, including the one from which this institution arose, use something called a litany as a means of coming together in community. It's an old form. It uses multiple voices. And I'd like to borrow that form today by reading together the litany of scholarship which is printed in the program. I'd like to ask the readers to come forward and I'll preface the litany with just another short statement. The University of Pikeville is a Christian college that strives to represent the broadest 
and best of Christian hospitality. While many in our community are comfortable proclaiming the words that follow as their own, there are people in the Upike family who hold beliefs that are different. We recognize and welcome everyone here, whether you agree with these words or not. Feel free to read aloud with your representative or remain silent and sit. When Jesus was asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like unto it, Love your neighbor as yourself. Like the lawyer who asked Jesus the question, we are quieted by his answer. We who believe long to love God and keep God's commandments and are moved to confess and to consider what this means for us. We who long to love our neighbor are likewise challenged. We who believe confess that we have not always kept the greatest commandments. We have not always loved God with all that we are and have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. When we come anywhere close to loving God, it is only through God's immeasurable grace. But we who believe long to love God wholly and unfailingly with all that we are. And we believe that this command is embodied in the love that we demonstrate to those around us, especially those with whom we disagree. That's why we are here at this time in this place. We, we who believe want to know what it means to love God with our hearts our souls and our minds. We want to show that love to everyone with whom we interact. Is it an ironic that as members of an, of an academic community, we seem to think the least and know the least about loving God with our minds? We've too often been deceived by the notion that love has nothing to do with the intellect, nothing to do with thinking or imagining, nothing to do with wrestling to understand, we forget that love rejoices in the truth. But we want, we want to remember, we want to discover truth. And we forget all the places that truth can be discovered, in scripture of course, but also in libraries and laboratories, on athletic fields, in the gymnasium, in scripts and scores and in the laws of signs and angles, with microscopes and stethoscopes, beside a kiln or a clarinet, embedded in a lecture or a leaf or a link, woven into a financial statement or a speech or a sonnet, bound into a book on Newton's second law, on educational psychology, on World War II. We, we want, want to remember. remember. We, we need, need to remind one another. another. We, we want, want to discover the truth and dedicate ourselves to understanding. understanding. Such a desire is meaningless without commitment and hard work. It involves taking care of our bodies and souls. It involves exercising our minds. It requires reading, listening, observing, collaborating, memorizing, questioning, articulating, thinking, and writing. It requires sketching and plotting, imagining, theorizing, explicating, analyzing, resting when the body and mind need rest. It requires explaining and re-explaining, figuring and refiguring, demonstrating and illustrating, practicing and practicing some more. Help us, Lord, Lord to commit ourselves to the pursuit of truth, to loving you with our minds. To devote our time, gifts, and energies to the gaining, the deepening, and the sharing of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. To pursue an education and not just credits, knowledge and not just diplomas, wisdom and not just degrees. To maintain humility, always acknowledging the infinite mysteries of faith and the dimness of our own understanding. To admire and support disciplines and intellectual interests different from our own. To resist laziness, indifference, and contempt. To deny temptation to waste time, to resist distorting the gifts of leisure, entertainment, and technology so that they thwart our efforts to learn. 
to value and respect one another as members of the Upike family. Help us in all of this. We can become a community that loves our neighbor and pursues truth. We are expected to help one another in this. Shored up by our hope and grace, will you help one another? We will. Will you encourage and direct us with patience and compassion as we learn what it means to preserve truth and love one another? We will. And will you do the same for us and for each other? We will. We will. Today we commit ourselves to the pursuit of truth, heart, soul, mind, and strength. We also commit to act in ways that love one another and thereby maintain a transformative learning community at the University of Pikeville. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. If you would stand, beloved, to receive the benediction. Now, as this year unfolds like the pages of a textbook, may the great author of your soul bless you with the riches of wisdom, the passion for truth, and compassion for others. May this year be a time of personal growth, new sensitivity of ears to hear the stories of those who are hurting, and a time of developing long-lasting spiritual practices. May you grow in the riches and depths and intimacy of the love of God. May you be showered with the steadfastness and the delights of Jesus the Christ. And may the never-ending surprises and invitations of faith from the Holy Spirit be yours today and all throughout this year. May you be given the gift of peace, no matter the trial, no matter the truth, and no matter the consequences. Now go and show mercy as Christ has shown unto our university. Give mercy, give peace, go in grace. Amen. Mm -hmm.